the world. I worked for the Walt Disney Company for Disney for 16 years, and we as a company, international big company, have to track and understand what's happening in the world that our company needs to be mindful of. And so I started looking at all the, all the plastics legislation. So we know Costa Rica, uh, just this month, uh, finalized their plastics legislation prohibiting straws, mandating plastic waste management education programs, recycling actions that, um, that importers and producers plastic containers have to be responsible, so that's awesome. That's what we like to see in zero waste. And that plastic bags have recycled content. So this is great leadership and this is gonna help bring Costa Rica to a better uh, uh, era of better uh, resource management and getting towards zero waste. But all around the world it's happening and we don't always have all the answers. So right now the UN has their sustainable development goals that I love because they're telling everyone, every country uh, on the planet that we need to be mindful of life on life below water and on responsible consumption and production, which talks about reducing waste and managing organics through composting. And so we have that directive from the highest uh, organization in the world. And then the European Union has been doing all kinds of work around banning single-use plastics. They've got about 20 items that they want to stop producing. And so uh, when that happens, when the EU, as big as it is, that's going to influence all the other uh, uh, countries in the world. France banned plastic cups by 2020, requiring that um, food tableware be made of um, compostable materials and um, wanting uh, things that, an increasing diversion by 60%. Germany also is trying to reduce plastics, uh, eliminate, uh, oh, increase reusable packaging, very important, reutilizar the um, continuadores, increasing recycling, improving compost. And then Norway is also fast-tracking a plastics ban. They're planning to um, cover pl uh, cutlery plates, straws, chopsticks, cotton swabs, and ring stirs by next year, really soon. Scotland is also trying to um, reduce plastic straws. Again, again the, um, the UK itself is doing a lot of work and uh, uh, asking for greater use of recycled plastics, to discouraging difficult to recycle plastics. So that's a big challenge for us everywhere in the world, is that packaging has become more complex. And that a lot of things that used to be paper or plastic or metal are now paper, plastic, and metal, all together, all fused together. And so it's very difficult for a recycler to separate those materials in order to be able to recover them. So we're dealing with some big challenges, all of us, all of us around the world, to, to solve these issues. Canada, of course, Canada we know is very environmentally progressive and Vancouver, uh, they're banning straws and planning to reduce styrofoam cups and take out containers. Jamaica also, because what we're realizing is that tourism suffers when there's litter. Costa Rica is very clean. We know that you're conscious of making sure your country is beautiful and that the tourists don't see litter where they go. But there's some places, Jamaica is still challenged, many places in Southeast Asia. You know that you go to a beach and you see the garbage and you don't have a, it's not as nice of an experience. You may not want to travel there anymore. So it's very important to these countries that rely on tourism. India is taking some very big steps to reduce their packaging. They're trying to reduce all their containers, spoons and forks. And uh, Indonesia as well. Now Indonesia has many problems with uh, litter because they don't have collection. They don't have trucks. They don't have landfills. A person in Indonesia gets a, plus, a product um, with packaging. The only place they have to put it is in their yard, in their river. And so it's not, I don't even blame the people there because I see it's, it's too, it's difficult, it's not easy. So Indonesia has some big challenges and they're trying to work on this. Of course, many of these countries prior to maybe five or 10 years ago only use natural materials. They use a leaf of a banana. They eat at home. They don't have products in packaging. So for them, dealing with the modern problems of, of plastic waste packaging, it's a new challenge for them. And so the idea is let's, let's not go that, let's not keep going that direction toward more plastic packaging. Let's try to figure out how we can enjoy our food and not have things that we can't recover or that we're, 
multinational companies are maybe producing and making a profit selling there, knowing that country has no means of responsibly handling waste. So, you know, these are big challenges. Malaysia, again, they're trying to, uh, they've, they've given themselves till 2030 to deal with their uh, zero waste plan, uh, charging for plastic bags, only offer straws on request, all those little things. Um, South Korea, Sri Lanka has banned uh, polystyrene food containers and shopping bags and banning all polyethylene products. Taiwan is a blanket ban on still use products just a couple years ago. Um, Thailand plans, this, as you know, China and Thailand and some of the countries that used to process recyclables, they don't want that anymore. So, zero waste people, we've always said, keep your resources. Those are materials that if you are smart and think smart, you will reuse those in your own country. When you ship materials to another country, bye-bye, no more resources. Maybe you, you, you harvested the forest, Los Vascas, and you, uh, you dug mining, and, and those materials you used one time, and you threw them away. It's not responsible. It's not a good use of resources. So it's, it's almost a good thing that China and these other developing countries don't want our materials because now we have to be responsible. Um, the United States is, is not a, right now not a great time in U.S. for environmental uh, initiatives, new, new things. But our, um, we did authorize a Marine Debris Act. Um, saying that if there was a plastics issue, that it could be a, a severe marine debris event and that our country would address it. So that's a little bit of progress. Uh, many countries have uh, bottle bans or mandatory recycling laws, including many U.S. states. And polystyrene, styrofoam has been banned all over, the, um, all over many, many uh, cities in the U.S., especially on the coast, cerca de los playas, las playas. California, where we're from, has many laws to encourage recycling, and that's why, you know, we love that our state has, is exercising leadership and hopefully showing people the way to go. So we've got, a, like Costa Rica, so Costa Rica may want to look at California's law requiring recycled content in plastic bags, because you're trying to do that now. So we've been doing that since a long time, 1994. Um, we have another law that requires uh, plastic packaging either be reusable or refillable or recyclable. Um, it's challenging to implement. It's not perfect yet. We have another uh, ban on carry-out bags at grocery stores. You don't get a, un, un saco uh, gratis. Necesito comprar un saco o no saco. More so. Yes, sorry. Okay. And then the big law, the big exciting law, it recently, California, is our Circular Economy and Plastic Pollution Act that just was introduced in 2019. Um, it's proposing recycled content, and that's important because we need to have demand for the materials we're collecting. We need to have markets that will buy those materials. So by having laws that say you must use recycled content, it helps the recycling industry. Um, and then many companies, many private companies, are also adopting bans. And uh, the Walt Disney Company where I worked, they banned straws. They're trying to eliminate the, um, the hotel bottles, the shampoo bottles in hotels and have them bulk and to try to reduce um, styrofoam as well. And all these other companies, Alaska Airlines, which flies to Costa Rica, Bon Appetit, um, Marriott, big hotel chain, Royal Caribbean, many companies are, are working on this together. And then plastic bands from bigger plastic bands, not just straws. And uh, as anybody read National Geographic, National Geographic magazine, they have many, many resources and information now about plastic pollution. They've taken this on as an issue and they have a planet or plastic program where there's a lot of data about where the pl problems with plastic are coming from and what's being done to address them. So I recommend National Geographic as a, as a resource for all of us working on these issues. Okay, so now I want to talk about um, what I'm mainly here for is our business certification program and individual certification program called TRUE, Total Resource Use and Efficiency. It's a, it's a program to help businesses figure out how to get to zero waste. And so um, it's, it, was a, it started grassroots by people that wanted to, to see businesses do better and to support businesses who were trying to do the right thing. 
And uh, so Steny Barger is our leader, and she loves Costa Rica, and she would love to come Costa Rica to help more businesses in Costa Rica achieve true certification. So true is actually, uh, we have the same zero waste goal that Rick and Ruth may have mentioned, that we're, it's, it's an aspirational goal, aspirational. Um, that we want to emulate natural um, cycles and all discarded materials are considered resources that can be used for other uses and that we will not burn or bury our, our, our materials and eliminating all discharges to land, water, and air. So all of the, the true organizations are trying to divert solid waste from disposal and from um, burning waste energy and from the environment. So uh, to try to here, I'll, I'll say this now. Okay, so to, try, to become a true zero waste company, a company has to have a zero waste policy in place. They have to be diverting at least 90% of all the waste they make, 90% diversion. So for some companies that have simple waste, it's easier. For a, a company, a large company with complex operations, it's more difficult. But the idea is we all are aspiring to try to get to all the way to 100%, but because we know some of it, it's, there's some things that are impossible right now to recycle or compost no matter how hard you try. So we say, okay, 90% is your goal for zero waste right now. Eventually, 100%, right, Rick? Okay. And that, and that the company has to meet all laws, of course, and uh, not be, you know, polluting. And that you've, you have data to document your, your um, recycling numbers, your diversion numbers, and that you provide those numbers to the organization, and uh, that you don't have more than 10% contamination of your material, and that you, you provide a, a, a case study that you write a little bit about what your company did, and, and, and we share that information to in, encourage other companies. So the certification levels. So TRUE is part of U.S. Green Build, Building Council. So you, uh, some people are familiar with the LEED building system, LEED. Have you, you seen LEED buildings, Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design? So now TRUE is part of that system because so many companies want to reach zero waste. So similar to LEED buildings, they have a, a, an entry level certified and then a silver level, a gold level, and a platinum le level if you've achieved the most points. So I'll show you the, the points. So the interesting thing about the true rating system here is recycling, only three points for recycling. So recycling is important, but only three points. We want to see companies redesign. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. <clears throat> we want to see companies redesign to prevent waste. We want to see more things be reused, not, not just recycled. We want composting. We want composting to happen in all the companies. We want purchasing. We want the people that are buying products for your business to understand, what am I buying that might be ending up in my trash that I can't recycle? I want to not buy that, or I want to ask my supplier to change what he's giving me so that I can recycle, or I can compost, or I prevented the waste altogether. Very important. And then leadership. We want to see companies being an example to others to say, you know, Javier here who has composting in Costa Rica and he's supporting Costa Rica businesses that want to compost. And so we're all here together, hopefully talking about all of, all of the, the programs that Costa Rica needs and all the economic opportunities and helping build this here so that lots of businesses and everyone can participate and, and achieve these goals. And then closed loop system is another example. So closing the loop means, okay, I have a paper and I use my paper and now I'm, my paper's done and I recycle it and now in the recycling bin goes to a company that makes new paper with recycled content and now I, the company, buys back paper with recycled content. I tell my paper supplier, I need you to have recycled 50%, 30%, and then I'm closing the loop. I've made paper and I close the loop. So total points possible altogether is 81. And we see businesses achieving this all the time. We have several hundred businesses that have um, received zero waste certification. So this is just a brief overview of the top five actions to expedite true zero waste certification. One, if you're not for zero waste, how much waste do you want? Do you, how much? Zero is good. Cero es bueno. <laughs> So again, you know, we know the problems with 
with not recycling and not collecting waste caused all this ugly litter. And also just worse than the, the visual is the, the, the feeling of having not used our resources responsibly. The Japanese have a, a beautiful word. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's a word, it's motayanai. Do you want to say motayanai? It means I feel shame when I've wasted. I feel shame. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice shame in español? Vergüenza. 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 Motayanai. So, and we all feel that. You're here today because you understand how important it is that waste and resources are used responsibly. So thank you. Um, of course, oil is a big issue, obtaining new oil, many issues with oil, war, um, oil spills, uh, you know, you know all the problems with, and the pollution and greenhouse gases, we all know we need to be using less petroleum, less oil, there's, on, there's not unlimited supplies, Ev everything we do for zero waste is going to help us not depend on uh, limited finite oil anymore. Consumers, of course, people, a, a mom shopping, a dad, and she wants her, her child to have a better life in the future, so she's thinking when she goes to the store, what am I buying? Can I buy my bananas not in a package? Um, can I buy things that I can recycle at my house? Um, what can I do as a consumer to make sure that I'm true and recycling and reducing waste as much as possible? Of course, zero waste is very much connected to climate change issues, and I think Rick and uh, Ruth both mentioned it, but that landfills are a big source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, especially when organics are going to landfill. Organics create that methane gas, which is much worse than carbon dioxide in causing climate change. So that's why it's super important. And um, we understand that Costa Rica has a lot of organics still going to landfill. And we want to we want to encourage companies to have those programs, encourage government to support. And we hear that they are, that everybody's thinking about. Because Costa Rica is farms. People produce food here. And we need to feed our earth. And so comp when we collect the compost from the business and, and return it to the farms, it's, it's better for everyone. It's a better system. Um, and uh, meeting goals. Anyway, we also already talked about creating more jobs that composting and recycling jobs uh, create 75 to 250 jobs for every uh, 1,000 tons. So if we were recycling 90 or 100 percent, we would have jobs for everyone and we would be using all of our resources properly and efficiently. The second thing, leadership training, having that leadership. All of you here today are demonstrating your leadership and wanting to help move zero waste here in Costa Rica. So we want to, and we want to advance the integrity and credibility of zero waste. One of the challenges before our organization existed was companies would say, we're zero waste to landfill, which meant they may have been burning a lot of their waste. We didn't think that was a, a good claim to some zero waste. We want you to true zero waste and to really have addressed everything holistically and responsibly, not just not sent things to a landfill. That's not, that's not good enough. So uh, Rick has another hierarchy. We are, this is a different way to say that we want to redesign, re reduce, and return first, then reuse, repair, and remanufacture. Here in Costa Rica, it's common to ha you have a shoe repair place, and people you know, can fix cars or electronics, right? I think, I think here in Costa Rica, you still have repair resources. In US, very few very hard to find someone to fix a shoe or to fix your, 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 your lav lav lavanderia, your washer, your dryer. It's difficult. And people buy things, they break, and they throw them away. It's terrible. So we want to keep supporting those businesses that are helping uh, people keep, keep those items in use as long as possible. And to be buying quality products, buying things de calidad, so that they last a long time, mucho, mucho tiempo, todos um, mis productos. And then, and then, when we've done those things, then we can think about recycling and composting, and then landfilling, hopefully muy pequeño. So our true advisor program is for people like us that want to help businesses achieve zero waste. So the true advisor, uh, 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 obtain some training and learning out the system and then they take a test online just like you would for a lead 
certification and when you pass the test you become a true advisor and then we put your name on a website and the businesses can call you and say hi I need help so just uh, yesterday we're staying at a, a hotel in San Jose and we're helping them show them how to do the certification process and we're going to give them a report uh, tomorrow today to tell them whether how well they're doing to get to zero waste um, so we talk being the change, being, being here today, being the people that are going to influence it, creating new markets, new composting sites, having events, as Ruth talked about, all the ways you can educate and use social marketing and get everybody participating. You know, we understand right now that in Costa Rica, it's not common to talk about a diversion rate, a diversion number, where you would say, of all the waste, we recycled 10% or 20% or 30%. And in U.S. and other places, it's very common to, uh, to know the numbers, to have the data of the, all the waste, this is how much. So we would love to encourage Costa Rica businesses, universities. We understand UNED is at 80% diversion. Manrique is correct? 80%. So, so UNED knows how much their diversion and other businesses may. But overall, the country, el país, todo, necesita que decir que percento de todo de la basura es recycled, right? Or diver being diverted, not just recycled. All the ways, all the ways it was prevented, or composted, or recycled, or reused. So we, so we want to encourage that idea. And we can, our, our classes, we can teach you more about how to do the calculations and, you know, manage a database that has the numbers that helps you, and, and that helps you set targets and goals, metas. Uh, una cero ways meta, right? Okay, not, not a goal like soccer, goal, but right? <laughs> different. <laughs> so then a zero waste audit is different than a, a waste audit. You just look in the trash and you see, did we recycle or, or, or put things in the right bin? A zero waste audit starts at the top. What did we purchase that maybe we couldn't recycle? And it's thinking much more broadly about all of the waste. And so these are people sorting materials. But as I say, now, now the zero waste audit means, okay, we see we're, we have this material, we can't recycle it, how can we not buy that anymore? How can we find another material which we can recycle or which isn't there at all? It's gone because we've designed better and have a better system. So, and then prioritizing the majority. As I say, you know, things are challenging. One of the most challenging things right now is that packaging has become so complex. As I mentioned, the different material together, paper, plastic, and metal in one container, difficult to recycle. But so right now we say prioritize the big stuff. Work on the organics for Costa Rica we think is very important because there is a lot of it and the businesses need a place to, to have it composted like Javier. And uh, so the more we can worry about the big heavy stuff, and, and maybe things that are challenging or not possible right now, we can worry about later or as a, as a world, we can hopefully cause those companies that are making complex packaging to figure out how to recycle those things we can't yet recycle in our countries. Uh, so redesigning, rethinking, reducing, reusing, going beyond recycling is our slogan. So just a, a few highlights, Toyota, we have Toyota here in Costa Rica, I know. Toyota has done amazing work um, using reusable containers. So when they, they used to produce um, car parts and ship them in boxes and then recycle the boxes. Now they don't use boxes, uh, carton, they use only reusable. Um, and, they, and they deliver the parts and they return the empty and they refill it and they return it over and over and over. No more recycling of cardboard. So it's better. It's better for the environment. It's better for Toyota. Toyota thinks they've saved about a billion dollars in packaging costs by thinking this way. And that they've eliminated, uh, that they're using 60,000 reusable shipping containers traveling through their network. And so all that helps Toyota be a better company, helps provide, helps them produce cars for us at a cheaper price and helps their shareholders have a better return on their investment in Toyota. Second, uh, the last is total participation. The idea that everyone has a stake in, in zero waste. And so upstream, as I mentioned, your vendors, your suppliers, the designers, the people that are marketing materials, the people that are telling you to buy the thing. Then in operations, the people that are preparing the food, providing the food. The janitorial, the custodians, the people that are cleaning and to understand that they're part of very important part of zero waste. 
property management companies. We have many property management companies in the U.S. which are involved in zero waste because it saves them money. Downstream uh, is the waste hauler, the recycler, the composter, and the farmer. All of them are part of a zero waste system. And then in the community, food banks, where you can donate edible food. We understand maybe in Costa Rica, it's contra la ley para donar um, comida um, comestable. Um, maybe in the U.S., uh, there's a law, the Good Samaritan Law, which says if you as a business donate food, if somebody got sick from your food, n you can't sue, no liability. So what's happened is it makes it easy for a, co uh, a company to donate safely. And the thing is, almost no, nobody has ever been sued. Always when you're donating, it's, it's in good faith. The businesses want to do the right thing and to help people who are hungry. They don't donate bad food that's going to make someone sick. It's a good system and it protects the, the donor, the business, and provides food for hungry people. And so our priority for food waste is that first we want to prevent food waste by not serving too much food, not making too much. Then we want to feed people, hungry people, then feed animals, and then compost. So that's our priority and, and that's what we try to do. We have uh, programs in the U.S. where a supermarket have me carne and carne un poco viejo. They have they feed to a zoo to an animal in a zoo and the animals. And I think some of the compost programs here are feeding pigs, and then the pigs provide food back to the restaurant for 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 their meals. So these are all of the stakeholders in a zero waste system. And so hopefully here we have people from all all of these areas that can help drive this. And then, you know, talking, getting together, looking at the data, understanding what's, what's happening, where you have opportunity, where you haven't been able to, to succeed. Maybe you call the company, you call your neighbor. Hey, you have this material, I have that material, maybe we can exchange. And all the communication and collaboration, so really, I mean, we love it. We're, we're having a good time. <laughs> so Chicago, I'm sorry, Kellogg's in Chicago is another company that um, was not recycling very much, and then they uh, took the challenge to become true certified. Now they have 95% 95, 95 diversion and reduced their waste management costs by 80%. So this company is, of course, very happy that they have achieved such great savings and the distinction of being zero, a zero-waste company. Again, I mentioned the purchase. You are what you buy or don't buy. So you re rethink the resource life cycle, that our true system is a whole systems approach to, to think about every part uh, that you're doing and redesigning when you can't recover and um, demonstrating to the world that you, you can minimize your waste output when you, when you put your mind to solving this. Um, this is another example. This is a, a company Raytheon in the U.S. that's zero waste certified and they eliminated polystyrene. They uh, started using reusable dining ware and they, they uh, were compostable alternatives. One question people ask about reusable dishes is they say in in U.S. we have in California we have drought, not enough, no, no bastante lluvia. <laughs> so it's important. So they say maybe I'm saving water by using disposables and not washing my dishes. No, in fact, it takes a lot of water at the factory to make the disposable. So we do life cycle analysis, like a scientist would, to determine what's the best. What's the best thing? Is it a disposable? Is it a reusable? It's a reusable, always. The data shows. Even all the water to wash, sorry, all the water to wash the dishes is not as much as the water at a factory. And especially if you have an energy efficient dishwasher and a dishwasher that uses low water. So really important. And also, everyone likes to eat off of a nice plate with a nice fork. It's better dining experience. You want to enjoy your meal, not be in a hurry and have the garbage. And that's not a nice, that's not so nice. So. Um, this is showing Closing the Loop and Producer Responsibility, a company that's taking plastic bottles, grinding them up, using them to make carpet and carpet uh, under underlayment, and then, um, yes, closing that loop. Then another example is um, the, the bars there. Those are shampoo bars from a company, Lush. It's a UK company, and they sell shampoo. It's just a, a, a disc no package, no plastic, no palm oil. And you put it and make soap. And, and so we understand there's a company in Costa Rica making the shampoo bar. 
bio, somebody said it, bio lab, bio lab, yes. So this is wonderful that companies, are, how to get rid of the water, which you didn't need in a product like in your detergent, just give me the, the concentrate, the, the, the thing I need to clean my hair or my dishes or my clothes. So it's really great people are, and even toothpaste, now there's a company that makes, instead of a, a toothpaste tube, which you can't recycle, they make a little tablet uh, in, in a, a jar that you can recycle, and the tablet put on your toothpaste and, and toothbrush and it cleans your teeth. No more, no more uh, toothpaste tube. So all these kind of ways of redesign, and also bulk. So bulk uh, grocery stores, which have items that you fill your own container, or we see in hotels, the hotels are using the, um, containers for the shampoo and not having the little, the, the, the botellas pequeñas. This is a company that sells tea, so they redesign so that the tea box is all recyclable metal and the shipping, the, the packaging, the um, protection is the um, plastic, uh, plastic bag with air and plastic bags are very recyclable. If you collect them together, you can recycle plastic bags and then the box also, the customer can recycle the box. So this is our website, true.gbci.org, and there's lots of resources there. Uh, there's the rating system. You can study the rating system. You can study the, the, the booklet for if you would like to become a true advisor. And we would love to come back to Costa Rica next year and do a training so that the, 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 the people that take could become true advisors. So, so that's an opportunity we could do in the future to build our knowledge here and then an application form if a business would like to pursue true certification and a registration form. It costs about 1,300 to 1,500 for a business to apply for true certification. So it's not so expensive, but, um, but we hope, you know, we would love to see, we have some true certified in, in Mexico and somewhere else in South America, but we want to see the first one in Costa Rica soon. So, Answer the question, leadership leading, zero with audit, total participation, you are what you buy. And there's our contact information. All right, how am I on time? I, okay. Um, we're, are we doing questions now or later? Yeah, after. Okay, so we're doing questions. So I think that's it for my presentation. I'm so glad to have been here to talk to you today. And buena suerte con su cero basura, cero desperdicios Costa Rica. Thank you, Mary Alice. Um, a continuación se abre un espacio para preguntas del público. Si alguno desea hacer una pregunta, solamente levante la mano y se les facilitará el micrófono para dirigirse a cualquiera de los expositores aquí. ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Sí. Bueno, bueno, muchas gracias por la, eh, su, sus ponencias, ha estado muy interesante. Eh, aquí en Costa Rica, uno de los problemas que yo también veo es con, el, con los desechos que tiene que ver con lo sanitario, ¿verdad? El papel higiénico, etcétera. Entonces, yo siempre me he preguntado, ¿cómo se hace con el papel higiénico? Para eso se puede hacer compostable, ¿verdad? Like, entonces, eso, eso, eso sería una. Y después, la certificación, este True Certification, eh, ¿Ahorita es solo para negocios? ¿Only for business? ¿O también hay para ciudades, escuelas? Ah, ok. Sí, es posible compostar los papeles de sanitario. ¿Higiénico? ¿Higiénico? En, en Estados Unidos y otros um, países uh, poner el, el papel en, en el inodoro. So, en Costa Rica es diferente por nosotros que poner en una basurera cerca de el inodoro. It's different. Um, so, we understand that um, usually you want to compost those materials separately because, oh, I can't listen to this. <laughs> um, because biosolids have certain um, restrictions, you, have, you may have to compost those separately. So that, I think that would be a program to ask your, the wastewater treatment company, and, the, and, and I don't know what, what the, our wastewater treatment in US, they make biosolids, which then they use to fertilize non-food crops. 
So I think it's possible. I think you would need to talk to people that maybe are already handling wastewater to see whether they could. I don't know if you have any, do you have anything else to, it, it is possible to compost, but you don't want it in a normal compost system, which is used for food, just in case somebody is sick and, 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 and their sickness could be in the food and crops. So it's, it's challenging. But, um, you know, the other solution we talked about, we talked about this last night, bidets in, in, uh, in uh, South of, so, 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 sorry, Southeast Asia, other Asian countries, you know, it's common to have the water to wash and then less paper. So that's, you know, I think some people may have in Costa Rica. It, it's not the easiest thing to do, so maybe we worry about that later. <laughs> and then to answer the... The true certification program, yes, is for schools, uh, businesses, organizations, yes. Not, not for homes, not for individuals. Yeah, the individual would become an advisor, but yes. So, yes, it could be, a, it could be the university, the UNED, yes. Okay. Buenos días, eh, mi nombre es Evelyn Hernández, eh, trabajo para la Municipalidad de Desamparados eh, y quería contarles que en conjunto con la Municipalidad de La Unión y la Municipalidad de Curridabat, que hoy se acompañan, y Montedioca y la Municipalidad de San José, estamos eh, conformando una mancomunidad hacia Basura Cero. Prácticamente somos... Eh, o queremos regionalizar el tema de los residuos eh, para la provincia de San José y de Cartago. Eh, iniciamos este año con este modelo y pues quisiéramos que en algún momento ustedes nos visitaran para contarles nuestra experiencia, además de trabajar el tema de residuos eh, ordinarios, eh, no tradicionales, ahorita la comunidad. Eh, tiene alrededor de 2.000 composteadores que hemos conformado desde el año pasado eh, para trabajar todo el tema de eh, eh, también de gases de efecto invernadero como una de las segundas fuentes de generación en el tema de residuos orgánicos. Entonces, eh, nos ponemos a disposición de ustedes también para que nos puedan apoyar en el tema de la mancomunidad que como les dije, la estamos conformando Quizás el otro año ya la tengamos conformada. Eh, también estamos desarrollando un proyecto con eh, una organización que se llama Contarina eh, en Italia. Eh, también nos van a financiar un proyecto de manejo de residuos orgánicos eh, a gran escala. Eh, y pues bien, muchas gracias y muy interesante. Sí, muchas gracias por las presentaciones muy interesantes. Tengo unas preguntitas. Primero, el tema de la charla era cero basura y los 12 mercados, el manejo de los residuos. Si nos pudieran recordar cuáles eran los 12 mercados para tenerlos en mente, esa es una pregunta. Y otra pregunta que tengo es tal vez un poquito más difícil, es una inquietud o una pregunta no muy bien pensada tal vez. Eh, muchos de los desarrollos tecnológicos. Have to use the mic, or they can't translate it. Muchos de los desarrollos tecnológicos de materiales nuevos, compuestos. Son hechos con el propósito, muchas veces, de proveer mejores empaques más livianos. Tomemos el ejemplo de una bebida de, para, como una gaseosa, como una Coca-Cola, una Fanta, una Pepsi, lo que sea. Antes venían en vidrio. Y entonces ha habido transición y cada vez es más delgado 
y cada vez es utilizando los plásticos porque son menos susceptibles a que se quiebren, eh, son más livianos, tienen un efecto positivo porque me puedo imaginar que un camión con, con botellas de vidrio pesa mucho más y en Costa Rica con todas estas montañas el uso de combustible para transportar de un lado a otro el vidrio también tiene sus consecuencias en la emisión de CO2 en el ambiente por combustible. Entonces, ¿cómo uno puede evaluar sin conocimientos y un análisis bien detallado cuál es mejor? ¿Compro la de plástico? Compro la de vidrio. Mi esposa me obliga a, a comprar la de vidrio. <risa> Yo no estoy tan convencido. <risa> Entonces, como consumidor, a veces uno no tiene la información necesaria para hacer ese tipo de, de juicio. Gracias. Bueno, well, I'll Ruth answer the difficult question. Uh, but uh, I would buy glass and only because... Uh, Glass is inert, and it doesn't have any emissions, but plastic will leach into your food. So you have to think about your health versus the energy savings. In terms of the 12 categories, there's the technical categories, which be paper, metal, glass, uh, paper, metal, glass, textiles, that's four, plastic, plastic polymers, five, um, Um, what's the sixth one? Uh, chemicals and reuse. And then on the organic side, it would be putrescible, soil, um, yard trimmings, uh, wood, um, one more. Huh? Rock, ceramics. Ceramics. And soil. So the, the, the organic ones are the half of it, and then the technical ones are the metal and the glass and the textiles. And in my experience, is, uh, I've found markets for all of those. What do you want to answer? Oh. Uh, so I think, yeah, so I think that for um, the, the, you know, plastic versus paper, plastic versus um, glass, we have a unique opportunity here in Costa Rica, which is we have refillables. We were so thrilled to see at the hotel where we're staying that the glass bottles can be refilled with new... Um, products and used over and over and over again. Reuse is always going to be better than recycling. Waste prevention, source reduction, you know, um, making food at home, drinking you know, water out of the tap is always going to be better than buying a product that you have to either recycle or compost. So reuse is always better. So I would encourage you to go for the glass, the refillable glass. Uh, there is the concern about plastic in health and in your body. That's something that is a growing concern, that plastic, because it's made from petroleum, because it's not inert, it does migrate. So there are other potential harmful effects of plastic. So I would encourage you to listen to your uh, partner and um, buy, buy in glass. I might, I might take a little different answer to that. <laughs> I like some products that come in unrecyclable packaging. I do. <laughs> and I don't want to stop eating those products. I don't want to stop eating chips or, or these certain energy bars I like. I want the company that makes that packaging to help me recycle that packaging. I want the company to know when you've made a package that reduces transportation impacts because it's lightweight, that's great, that's brilliant, that does the environment. But I need to know what to do with it end of life. I, as a consumer, as my city, my, my county, we need the solution. So there are organizations that are working to help recycle things that are not recyclable right now. One is the Carton Council, the Carton Council. It's an international organization for aseptic uh, packaging. What's the other word? Tetra Pak. Uh, Tetra Pak, which is challenging. So they're trying to address that. Another. Another organization is the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, SPC. Yeah. So they're working on flexible packaging. Flexible packaging is what almost everything comes to now. And it's true that that keeps products fresh and reduces food waste, which is important. So 
We just want the industry that produced the package to have the solution of life. So when they do, then Robert, you can buy everything you want and, and be, feel good about your choices. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, it's better to eat at home and eat healthy food, whole food. Um, bueno, para, <coughs> para tal vez responder, con todo el respeto de la, de la mesa principal, para responder al señor, eh, nosotros en las charlas que damos, eh, yo recomiendo definitivamente los productos naturales, aquí hay mucho limón ácido, naranjas, muchas frutas, eh, mejor que comprar ese tipo de productos que no es bueno para la salud y además no, no necesitamos extraer el agua de unas fuentes importantes, como son la Coca-Cola, eh, y eh, ir hacia lo orgánico y lo más natural posible, y que sea local. Buenas, casi tardes. Bueno, estamos en un momento electoral y de los espacios eh, políticos del Cantón de Flores, en Heredia, estamos muy preocupados por cómo la sociedad civil va a aceptar propuestas que tenemos en el cero basura. La gente está acostumbrada a tener sus calles súper limpias y lo ven como algo positivo, pero no, no es la hora de que tienen que hacerse cargo de su basura. Entonces, ¿cuál ha sido la experiencia de ustedes en ese sentido? Y también la otra pregunta sería la participación de la mujer a la hora de estos procesos. Gracias. Women? <laughs> in, in, in lots of societies, they exp in, in lots of societies, uh, or, I'm sorry, I was listening to him. Uh, in lots of societies, uh, they expect the women to do the work. I don't think that's real. I think in my house, I'm taking out the trash, and that's, that's okay with me. Oh, here. Uh, okay, so I started my career running government programs, running policy. In the last t t 10 years, we implement programs. The people are waiting for this. They've been waiting for a while. Uh, the last projects we finished were multifamily dwellings, maybe 200 units. And we'd go in and set up the recycling bin and talk to the manager, and then we'd go door to door to every household and say, here's your bag, this is what we want you to put the bins out there. We'll come back six months later and look at the bins. We got almost 90% purity on this thing. If you tell the people what you want and you have it well signed, uh, my take is about 70 to 80% of them will participate right away. That's my experience and uh, we're, we're, we're doing now multifamilies, we're doing schools. Uh, they're just ready. They're waiting for you to do this. and so. We'll put the program together to make them. Do you want to? So, okay. So, yes, the role of civil society and the role of women. In the in United States, our recycling organizations is, is like 60% or more women. Muchas mujeres en el movimiento de cero basura desperdicio. And, and so, yes, as, we, as I said in my slide, that it takes everyone. It takes the, the school child, the youth, uh, the, the students in university, the businesses, the homes, the shoppers, the consumers, everybody. Every, and I think consciousness is very high already in Costa Rica. Pura Vida is real here. Many years of thinking about this way. An organic uh, lady here. And uh, so I, I think there's lots of, I think there's so much potential for you to just take this to the next level of what you've already done. And, um, you know, one of the things we heard uh, this week is that maybe businesses pay the same, they pay for their trash in their taxes, and a business pays the same if they put out 20 bags, 20 sacos de basura, or solo uno bag de basura. So that's not an incentive to, for zero waste. If you as a business can make as much waste as you want, and it doesn't cost more, it's not helping zero waste. So we would love to see some, some leadership and some policy that would reward businesses who were doing the right thing, recycling and composting and making less waste, less things on the curb, and costing the, municipal, costing the city of San Jose or the country of Costa Rica less money because they've been responsible. So everybody needs to be talking, and you're all here today to connect and, and make this happen after we leave 
They'll help drive zero waste here in Costa Rica. Mujeres y hombres también. Buenas, sí, gracias. Eh, quería hacer un comentario primero y después una pregunta. Mi comentario va alrededor de cuando se habló de desperdicio de alimentos. En Costa Rica no es ilegal donar los alimentos. Eh, no tenemos una ley de buen samaritano. Entonces sí tenemos un vacío grande en política pública para poder hacer eso de forma consciente y responsable. Pero no es ilegal actualmente, para aclarar esa parte. Segundo, mi pregunta va más para... Ya que están aquí, eh, saber su opinión, un poco pick your brain en esta pregunta, sobre, hablamos de que hay un mercado global para los reciclables, eso se, se, se menciona siempre, y a través de la historia hemos aprendido, cuando China puso la primer restricción de importación de reciclables, nos dimos cuenta del problema tan grande que teníamos. Sin embargo, eso abrió puertas a que otros países en el sub, sudeste asiático, mayoritariamente, estén tratando ese, ese, ese residuo y con pocas herramientas para hacerlo de manera responsable. Entonces, como comunidad global, ¿qué estructura de gobernanza deberíamos estar poniendo en práctica para evitar que, que estos países, los países de desarrollo, sean los que están llevando esta carga tan grande? Gracias. So, you know, um, so one of the issues around uh, food donation is the perception of liability, this perception of concern. So in the U.S. and in California, where we have a Good Samaritan law, uh, you will still find businesses that use as an excuse why they aren't donating is because, oh, liability, lawsuits. There's never been a lawsuit. There's never been a lawsuit about, a con uh, but there's a perception of a concern. So I'll give you the example in Orange County, California, where Disneyland is. They also have um, the Angels uh, Baseball Stadium. And the Angels Baseball Stadium donates uh, their surplus food at, at, after the ball games to uh, food banks and to, um, to feed hungry people. But they need to guarantee that the system that they donate into is, is going to keep the food at a temperature of safety, right? There needs to be good food handling techniques and good food handling safety. So the health ministers uh, in Orange County, California, where the Angel Stadium are, they certify the food handling uh, personnel who collect the food and distribute it to the food banks that give it to hungry people on safe food handling techniques. So even there, there's no concern about liability. There has never been a lawsuit. There is still the perception of concern because of reputation. If I got sick because I ate a hot dog from Angel Stadium, the reputation would be worse than the potential lawsuit liability. And so there is still the concern on businesses that uh, because of their reputation, or maybe it's just an excuse, they are not donating. So what we have to do um, is to give them the confidence that they can donate and the food will be safe and it will be appreciated. It will go to somebody who could use it. So it, it's, it is a responsibility of those of us who want to see that food appropriately managed and going to the right place to set up the systems, either through the municipalities or through the health ministries, to make sure that there is a system that everyone can be assured um, that it's safe. One issue that we talked about yesterday at our workshop at Leeds University was transparency. And I think in government, in private sector, in civil society, in business, we would like to have transparency. I'm going to donate my food. I know where it's going to go. I know who's going to eat it. I know that they appreciate it. And so I think that robust um, food collection infrastructure, food distribution infrastructure, would give the businesses confidence to donate because there really isn't a concern about liability, but there are potential other concerns that are legitimate. And then what was the other question? <laughs> oh, you want to say that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would love to encourage Costa Rica to adopt a food waste management hierarchy, similar to what our US EPA has done, where, as I say, the first priority is to prevent food waste through good, good design, good systems, then feed people, then feed animals, then compost. So we understand the Minister of Environment is going to develop a composting plan for Costa Rica. Make sure you get that hierarchy in there. Go ahead and look at the US EPA website 
and see if you can get uh, uh, traction on adopting a similar system here, and I think that will help. To get down in the weeds, in the, the last couple of years, we are, our program, Richard Anthony Associates, are setting up uh, recycling programs in schools. And it's not just paper. They, they, there's a lot of food being served in schools. And my observation was that a lot of this food was just being thrown away. Uh, I, I drink a little bit of milk and toss it away. Well, what the Good American Law and what the rules are, we went to the nutritionist at the school and said, this is all good food. We don't want to throw it away. So we have what's called a share table. And it's, it's basically just a bin and there's ice on the bottom. So when the kid, if he doesn't want to drink his milk, he puts the milk on the share table and somebody else wants to drink it. Uh, I've been watching this. We've been doing, uh, we did 90 schools over the last three months setting up these school programs. Uh, sit there watching kids eat their lunch. It's amazing how many kids are hungry and it's amazing after lunch, how little is left in that share table. The, the best one I like is the principal of the junior high school in Carlsbad. At the end of the day, she takes all the food left in the share table, and she stands at the door when the kids go home, and she offers it to take it home. And I think this is really important. Uh, we need to make sure we feed our children. The second piece on the global part, uh, when, uh, when we were doing uh, work in Brazil, I, I followed the waste pickers to their processing area, and I saw the stuff stacked against the wall, and then they showed me on the laptop their prices for the material. And their price for the products were the same prices we were getting in Colorado and California, so it makes it a global market. But I think that what you ought to do, if you've got a million people in San Jose, they, I know there's a small paper mill here, and there probably is a small smelter. Most cities, big cities in the world, have to have packages for their products, and they have to have so they're there. So I would look for local infrastructure to, to keep the, the loop closed as you start to recycle your paper in your town, your metal in your town. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to use the global market. You really don't. And the last thing I would say is one of the biggest consumers in California of recycled materials is Mexico. So if, you're, if you don't look to Asia necessarily, look to Mexico as a place you could sell your products as well. Sí, eh, buenas, buenos días. Eh, mi nombre es Sergio. Este, yo observo que en Costa Rica hay muchos jóvenes sin trabajo. Muchos jóvenes, incluso que fueron a la universidad y que ahora están graduados o no se han graduado, pero no encuentran trabajo. Yo me quedé pensando cuando estas presentaciones de hoy en la mañana son excelentes. Felicidades. Yo creo que, que algo se puede hacer. ¿Qué, qué tal si... No sé, ¿qué, qué, qué, es, ¿qué se ocupa para hacer un certificador en True? ¿Cuáles son los requisitos? ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué tan difícil es convertir a un joven en certificador? ¿Qué tan difícil es eh, eh, educar a un joven para que entienda la economía circular? Muchos de los cursos que yo doy tienen que ver con economía circular. Entonces, ¿por qué no entrenar a la juventud a que empiece a entender qué cosa es la economía circular? ¿Por qué no dar capacitación en ese sentido? Y, y tal vez ellos empiecen a, a, a pensar en pequeños negocios que, que sean su proyecto de vida, para que no anden buscando trabajo por la calle y tal vez nunca lo encuentren. Thank you. Thank you for your support and your interest and enthusiasm. We absolutely agree that there's opportunities for youth and people of all ages to participate in a, a zero waste economy. And yesterday we taught at a, a Leed University. Tomorrow we're going to be a country day school and talking to the youth. And so uh, the true training, you can have an in-person training that's about an eight-hour course. Um, we would send professionals to do the training, or you can take it online. And it costs about $400. That may be a lot for a Costa Rica resident, huh? Maybe we should look into if we, if we want to offer that in other countries that we can help you with a better price so that. But yes, absolutely, we believe. And Dennis, um, our colleague Dennis here, he's part of the Zero Waste Youth Alliance. So he's trying to get youth all over the world to think about this too. And they have convergences. Fiestas grandes de jóvenes que hemos cero 
uh, Despicios. So there's many, many things happening around kids and, and zero waste. And sure, the True Advisor program is a great way to get, get kids involved. And the circular economy, then you know about Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Or you know Ellen MacArthur? They're the ones that are promoting the circular economy, and they have many clap, you know, information on their website, and they have conferences that you could go to and learn. So maybe you send us a few students there, and they can learn and come back and teach more people in Costa Rica, because yes, the circular economy is, it, for us, the word circular economy just came up like five, three, five years ago. We're like, that's the same thing we've been saying all along. Zero waste, uh, extended producer responsibility, cradle to cradle, all those words are the same thing as what, what the new word circular economy, so it's great. More the merrier. I wanted to talk a little bit about more about zero waste. We usually talk mostly about zero waste with regards to materials, you know, cans, bottles, newspapers, organics, right? But there's an aspect of zero waste is we don't want to waste the labor and we don't want to waste people. And in zero waste circles, we always talk about the fact that zero wasters are always happy, never satisfied. Because we are so happy that there is always something that we can do within society on zero waste, right? There's an opportunity in teaching. There's an opportunity in marketing. There's an opportunity in promotion. We need uh, entrepreneurs and scientists and engineers to invent the new products and the new processes. And we in the U.S., we have a major issue, a homeless problem, right? In San Diego and San Francisco, homeless. We know that there is a role for homeless to recycle cans and bottles, retrieve materials, and be a part of the system to support the circularity. So there is always going to be a role somewhere in society for zero waste. We just need to encourage it and promote it and incentivize it. So I, like you, look to uh, the future for folks to get training, to get uh, immersed in it. Uh, True Train is online. We trained yesterday. We have zero waste community associates that can help communities get to zero waste. True business advisors that can get businesses to zero waste. There's so much opportunity, and Elena and Anna Maria are going to be organizing Zero Waste Costa Rica to provide those training systems here locally. So I want to ask the question: uh, What what major industry was created without training their workforce? Recycling. As a manager of government programs, both in Fresno and in San Diego, when I got the mandate from my council to move forward and had to hire people to do the work, they weren't there. Most of my, my, my uh, employees were trained on the job. In uh, 2019, when we had the big recession, uh, they spent a, a trillion dollars to bail out the banks. Well, President Obama, who I love, uh, put a trillion dollars into social programs. So we went out and wrote a grant and got money to put training programs in, in, as an example in three community colleges, 18 uses of credit in resource management that was transferable over to the major university. Dennis is one, was one of my students eight years ago. Well, if you're going to have a system, you, you, that's where our flaw is. The university needs to, and I don't care whether it's a resource management or engineering, they need to put in this zero waste concept as part of the teaching part so that when these professionals come out of the university, they have a concept of what they have to do. And I think that's, that's the gap that we have to deal with. Este, bueno, primeramente agradecerles eh, todas las, las charlas interesantísimas, he aprendido mucho. Soy Ana Grace de la Universidad para la Paz. Y en la universidad estamos eh, pues trabajando para la eliminación del plástico de un solo uso. Sin embargo, nos hemos topado con el inconveniente de que la eliminación de la bolsa plástica ha sido un poco difícil. En, en las partes que hemos podido, hemos eliminado y hemos sustituido la bolsa plástica por bolsa de papel. Sin embargo, para los papeles higiénicos, como mencionaba por ahí mi compañera, pues nos hemos topado con la dificultad que solo lo podemos dar a la municipalidad en bolsas plásticas. 
Entonces, quisiera saber si hay alguna experiencia que ustedes nos pueden compartir para ver cómo eliminamos la bolsa plástica. Well, I, I think you have an opportunity here for um, innovation, right? Um, you, you have a problem that, um, you know, you need to overcome. You have uh, researchers, you know, you have municipal officials, you have government folks that understand what the problem is and can find solutions to fix it. Um, we were last year in Hyderabad in India, and their issue there was pollution of their lakes. They have 1,000 lakes, 900 are polluted from wastewater. And this is from sewage going in untreated into the lakes. So there was a unique problem for them. And so they, um, what they focused on, they brought in engineers from around the world to talk about the solution to wastewater treatment, which in the U.S. is very centralized, giant, multi-billion dollar facilities. That was an inappropriate technology for Hyderabad. It's inappropriate to have to invest in that kind of infrastructure for that city. Instead, the engineers said, we have a better idea. Disaggregated local solutions at the point of the, um, of the building. So a new apartment building, the wastewater treatment system. So it's disaggregated collection. This to us was amazing. We might not have thought about it because it's this the solution that we had where we live big, huge, multi-billion dollar centralized collection. So I think that the unique problem that you have with plastic bags and toilet paper here is something that is absolutely needed to be solved. I think there's many other things that we need to solve first, right? 58% of what is thrown away in landfills is not toilet paper, it's organic food and, 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 um, and plant trains, plant waste. So um, we think it's a very important thing to do And we know that there will be innovation and there will be a solution locally. I think the other aspect to think about is uh, when we were in Hyderabad, when we were in Kerala, in India, we were there with 80 very serious zero-waste professionals. And they are very serious in Kerala, in India, where they are reducing waste at the source of the household. And they are requiring segregation at the household, no centralized facilities, no universal collection, Nobody is coming to their door to pick up their cans of bottles except to buy them or their organics. They have to deal with them on site, compost on site at their households and at their place of businesses. But they asked us, you know, what do we do with uh, diapers, nappies, sanitary products? This is the zero waste that we need to be working on. And Rick and I were like, oh my gosh, we don't have a solution for you necessarily. I mean, in Kerala, they are focused on these last bits of things that are hard to address. And they will find solutions with, um, you know, reusable pads, reusable napkins, reusable diapers, and, and all of these other solutions that are out there. Um, so I'm not sure we have a direct solution for reducing and eliminating plastic bags that are needed for toilet paper, but I know that there will be an answer in this room, in this city, in this university, will address this issue. And it's very important in zero waste not to be embarrassed about these issues, right? These are the things that we have left over after we recycle and compost everything else. These are the hard issues that we have to address. And so it's very important that we look at it with clear eyes and think about how to, to solve it. And uh, we're absolutely here to support, but we know that there will be a local solution that's appropriate here. Did you want to add yeah, yeah, just so. Your challenge with the bags and the toilet paper is different than we have in the U.S. But we've, one problem our uh, true businesses have is that the, the, the waste hauler wants the uh, bags for office paper, for the collections within a big office building. The custodian collects bags from each desk, each trash can. And the, the company wants to not use bags. They want to use just open container, no bags, save money reduce resources, and the waste hauler says, oh, I know you have to have bags. So right now, it's a, a, they're trying to find the best solution so that um, the companies get what they want to reduce the plastic bags, and the hauler can still process the recyclables. So we had a webinar about it about two months ago, and we have some people that are working on this ongoingly. And so um, if you'd like to talk more, I can give you my card, and, and we can talk about what they're doing with bags in, in um, big office buildings.
So thank you for your question. So we say it's policies, programs, and facilities. They can't have a policy without a facility. Uh, I'm taking it backwards, uh, your water, your drinking water is your most precious item. We've got to deal with sewer treatment. Now, decentralized is a good idea. My answer on the, on, the, on the contaminated toilet paper is organic management. That is, with your organics, this stuff is picked up and it's compost, it's all fiber, it's all organic. It never hits a landfill, never hits a river. It goes to a farm and it goes compost. And you don't have to have a big giant facility. We found that uh, the big giant facilities are really hard to site. Everybody comes out of the woodwork and says, not in my backyard, but farms. Farms at the middle level would take that compost. When we were on the island of Hawaii, uh, that was a big issue. We went to the planning department and said, uh, well, what about taking the organics to the farm? He said, oh, no. So it's against the law for a farmer to grow soil? Well, no, no, that's okay. Look, so can he compost his own organics on his farm? Yes. Okay, can he bring in some organics to get more? Well, okay. And the final deal was as long as his composting facility on the farm is not bigger than the farm product was bananas or coffee, then it was just adjunct part of doing business. If it became bigger than that, then he was in an industrial facility. So my answer to you is, Let's look at decentralized facilities, get them started, and then you start with the policies and the programs. I think there would be one more thing to add with regard, particularly with things that uh, there's a ick factor, ooh, ick, um, yuck, you know, it's yucky. Um, is that, again, back to the reputational issue. So, for example, in San Francisco, where we work, uh, they have um, uh, composting, they have circular economy composting. The restaurants in San Francisco take the plate scrapings and the, the leftover food, the food scraps, they go to a composter that is an organic composter, and then they are sold to farmers that grow the produce and the wine grapes that those same restaurants buy for their serving at their, um, at their restaurants. So it's a circular economy for, um, for organics. Now, in San Francisco, uh, we have the highest per capita dogs per person in San Francisco. There are more dogs per person in San Francisco than anywhere else. There are. And the dog waste is picked up um, very well. You know, it's a law. You have to pick up your dog waste. But once you have your dog waste, what do you do with it? It is technically compostable. It is technically compostable. Just like toilet paper is technically compostable. There would be nothing wrong with composting toilet paper or, or dog waste in an industrial compost facility. It gets very hot. The, um, the, uh, the digestion, the, the bugs and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the, um, you know, the process of the composting uh, happens and uh, can be very efficient and it can be, make a very nice rich compost. In fact, in uh, China for uh, centuries, we have something we call night soil that we use on the crops and it's no problem at all. Okay. There's a reputational problem. So San Francisco is reluctant to let people know that they can put their dog waste into their compost system because of the reputational issue of all of these very high-end restaurants buying the produce and the wine that was created with the compost. So, re so even though there's no technical problem, there's no technical problem, it's a perception, it's a reputational problem. So again, these issues can be solved. They will be solved here. We are solving the problem in San Francisco. We can solve, pro you can solve the problem here in Costa Rica. Eh, buenas tardes, muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Andrea Acuña del TEC y quería hacerles una consulta. En el entendido de que debemos evitar, reducir, reutilizar, reciclar, si lo vemos actualmente o veamos la situación del país, ah, siempre vamos a tener residuos que no tienen mercado para el reciclaje, ¿verdad? Actualmente. ¿Cuál es su posición con respecto al procesamiento de residuos? Porque actualmente en el país una opción que se nos ha facilitado eh, es el tema de coprocesamiento en hornos cementeros, donde sustituyo combustible fósil y utilizo residuos como combustible. 
viéndolo desde un punto de vista de residuos ordinarios que no puedo reciclar, pero otros residuos que no hemos mencionado tanto, por ejemplo, los residuos peligrosos. Gracias. Yeah, you know, this is a difficult issue, and we work on this uh, with colleagues around the world. Uh, we work with an organization called Gaia, a global alliance for incinerator alternatives, and the, um, the processing of, you know, waste in cement kilns or incinerators as a solution for that end of the pipe material, take, make waste material that uh, we don't have a solution for now. We really don't think it's the right answer. So for several reasons. You know, number one, um, cement kilns, we need to work on sustainable cement kilns, right? So right now we do, there's a big push to replace fossil fuel with alternatives. We can consider some of the um, high P BTU value materials to be appropriate substitution. The problem is that becomes uh, reliant on that solution and we don't look for the alternatives. We really want the packaging waste that right now is not recyclable. We want those manufacturers to create a sustainable package. If we have that slippage into cement kilns or the incinerators, what would be the incentive for those manufacturers to create the true sustainable product, right? The other um, issue that came up for us yesterday was the eco bottle. An eco bottle is a great short-term solution, right? We, uh, the eco bottle is where you put uh, unrecyclable materials into a plastic bottle and then it gets used for sustainable construction. Okay, uh, it is a good short-term alternative for our materials. But, you know, we're not going to be able to use all the eco bottles that we could all create all over the place, right? There's going to be a limitation to how many eco bottles that we can use. So short term, great idea. Long term, we do need the producers and the manufacturers to create sustainable products and sustainable packaging. And um, we're going to be working on that issue um, to make sure that happens. And thank you for your question and thank you for your answer, Ruth, about th that maybe it's a temporary solution for things that aren't recyclable, but really the principle of zero waste in the circular economy, highest and best use. So like I said, when you've taken your forest resources to make paper and wood and you've mined your mountains to obtain minerals for products that you need and then you decide, ah, we've used it once, there's nothing else we can have to do, burn it in the cement kiln. Well, now you have ash. Now you take in your resources, use them one time, and burn them, and they'll forever not be useful. So really, you know, I understand cement kilns are, ne are necessary, and, and people need cement. Um, but yeah, I think there's, we're, it's not my, you know, we need an engineering solution and, and people to think about this better. But yeah, highest and best use, burning waste that we can't recycle now. We'd rather figure out how to recycle those materials and just burn them for ash. Thank you. Eh, buenas tardes, eh, mi nombre es Ángel Fernández, yo soy aquí, estudiante de Aronet, eh, eh, persona indígena de aquí, de los territorios indígenas. Eh, quiero saber qué piensan ustedes sobre los pueblos originarios, eh, principalmente eh, a lo largo de la historia de toda América, ha sido población indígena. Entonces, ¿qué, qué piensan ustedes sobre cómo es la cosmovisión que te de nosotros, de los pueblos originarios que, que a lo largo han puesto prácticas naturales que verdaderamente que han, han llegado a, a dar frutos realmente que han logrado verdaderamente que la tierra se mantenga pero que una manera nosotros no podemos solos porque eh, una manera de cultivar esa manera las semillas eh, ser la compañera utilizar el, 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 las semillas, todo esto y, y poner en práctica entonces eh, ¿qué piensan ustedes realmente? ¿qué valor le dan ustedes a sus pueblos originarios? Thank you, I think I love your question most of all es una pregunta muy importante el issue of indigeneity and the idea that yes indigenous peoples traditionally did live close to the earth 
and utilize resources efficiently and thought out the, the children and their children's children in our, our U.S. Native Americans, the seventh generation principle. So I have been participating in an organization called Bioneers, B-I-O-N-E-E-R-S. And that's one of their most important things they're working on now is indigeneity and acknowledging the role of learning from Native peoples what the best practices are to, to, save, our to save our earth and to do the, do the right thing with our environment. So I encourage you, the Bioneers website has amazing resources and they even have a person that's dedicated to bringing indigenous people into the organization to learn from and to attend events and teach other people. And so I'm really glad you're here and I'm really glad you asked that because you're absolutely right that there's knowledge that your people and other indigenous people have to share with modern um, people and, and thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. Bueno, el Centro de Educación Ambiental UNED, la Red Costarricense de Instituciones Educativas Sostenibles, Redes y la Organización Zero Waste Costa Rica, les da gracias por su asistencia a este evento. Eh, Doña Sonia tiene un presente para cada uno de los expositores de parte de la UNED. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes.